Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, We also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you and also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just wanna find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Peter Cliff. Peter is the principal at Christian School in Victoria, Australia. What's the podcast, Peter? Thanks, Jono. Nice to be here. 
First of all, uh, as I said to you before we started recording, we have lots of educators who listen in, um, but a lot of them even are in different parts of the world and we have a lot of people who aren't in education. So can you start off by just telling us a little bit about the organisation, the school, uh, and what you do as principal? Sure. So my role is uh, principal of Belgrave Heights Christian School. Belgrave Heights is an open enrolment uh, Christian school from kindergarten through, through to year 12. We have about 840 students and 140 staff. And the school is situated in the magnificent uh, Dandenong Rain, Ranges in outer eastern Melbourne. Um, it's, it's basically set in a forest. It's a really beautiful environment to have a school. It's actually my first year as principal at Belgrave Heights. Uh, prior to this role, I was the executive principal of Heatherton Christian College and Wyndham Christian College, which are also in Melbourne, a role I had for 21 years. So 2022 is actually my 22nd year working as a principal and my 35th year working in education. So I initially started as a primary school teacher, also did some secondary teaching, and then became a principal in my early 30s. So I was really thrown into that role at a young age. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing a little bit of your background, and we'll get into more of that through the podcast as well. But uh, uh, what, what a year to start. Um, uh, even for someone with so much experience, that, that is a uh, uh, yeah. couple of years with COVID to be stepping into mm, a new role in leadership in any sector. Mm, for sure. Uh, and, and, uh, and also great to hear about uh, 35 years. That's incredible. So let's, let's go all the way back childhood you know, you know when you were young growing up, what were some of the moments in that season of your life that really shaped you into the person and the leader you are today I was, I was reflecting on this and i think in terms of my career pathway into education i was influenced significantly by some of the teachers i had when i was a student at school and I guess most of the teachers I had were probably middle of the road. I probably can't remember a lot about them, but I did have a couple of exceptional teachers and I probably had some teachers that weren't great as well. But one particular teacher does stick in my mind. His name was Mr. Collins. He was my, I think that year nine or 10 uh, history teacher. And I remember coming into the classroom one day and we sat down and he was nowhere to be seen. And little did we know he was actually hiding in a cupboard in the room and we'd been learning about medieval European history and he burst out of the cupboard. He had this gown on and a sword and um, he was jumping around the tables and just so passionate about the subject. And we ha had this group of boys just completely engaged in the subject because of his approach. Um, it was a little bit like, um, you know, Robin Williams character in the film Dead Poet Society. He just had this way of, um, connecting with the students and yeah and I thought to myself you know that's I'd love to be a teacher like that one day just to really engage with the students and build strong relationships with them and that sort of I, I suppose planted a seed to set my career path down the path of becoming a teacher so I didn't really consider doing anything else um, but it was the effect of having some you know some really great teachers in my time as a student story you know it's um in a similar way for me i remember when i was in grade in queensland and i had an amazing teacher lindsay bettinson who uh who taught me legal studies and it was actually because of his passion for mm. passion for not only for law but how he taught and the concepts and he was so creative and um and i went and studied law and i remember for me I was so disappointed when I really got into law and realized, oh, wow, I think, um, I think for me, one of the things that I enjoyed most uh, wasn't so much the law. It was actually the way complex, mm. uh, these complex ideas. And so, but he had such an effect on me that I think he was probably one of the big reasons I initially went and studied law. Um, and so it's amazing the impact that a, that a great teacher can have on a, on a young person and, and what they do with their life. Mm, absolutely. So fast forward, fast forward from there. I'm interested to know, Peter, one of your first leadership opportunities, maybe it was uh, in some sort of team environment or 
I have. Um, I remember I've had someone talk about, you know, their their the entrepreneurial and they remembered. So I can't remember what it was, but some doing some sort of entrepreneurial, <laughs> hilarious things mm-hmm. in hindsight, which you go okay. that this of who they've turned out to be but it could be when you're a bit older in your 20s or um and you were you were responsible for a bunch of people or something but what comes to mind uh for me i i love sport growing up as as a particularly as, as as a teenager particularly afl football so having opportunities to you know captain a a football team was something that i aspired to and enjoyed doing and then later on i obtained my first leadership position in, in a government school, probably in my late twenties. And as I reflect back now, I realized I probably had no idea about leadership going into that role. And I was in charge of a section of the school and responsible, I, I think I had 35 students in my class with a whole range of behavioral and learning difficulties. And I also had a group of staff who are really Quite cyn- had become quite cynical about teaching and they were a lot older than me. And it was quite a difficult environment for me to, to lead in. And I, I clearly remember one day, there was the principal, the, the assistant principal, and I was sort of the next level down and they came to me and said, oh, they were both off, off site for the day and I was in charge for the day, like I was the principal. I mean, I was only in my late twenties and I just remember feeling completely overwhelmed, but I survived and looking back, it actually built my character. It was I suppose a case of sink or swim, um, but it was quite foundational into you know, building my capacity as a leader. Yeah, that's um, that's incredible. As you over your career, yeah. who is along the way? Yeah, who have been some of the biggest influences on you and your um, over those thirty-five years mm. that you've been in it? I remember uh, one of the first. Uh, teaching positions I gained when they, the state government back in, when I first became a teacher, you actually didn't apply for a job. You got a number based on your score at university. And then they'd go down the list. And once your number is at the top of the list, you're placed in a school. So there was no interview or anything like that. And then in about the mid nineties, they changed the system. So you could apply for a position and actually obtain a role on merit, which is the way it is now. And I got a job working in a brand new school that just opened and all of the staff were under 30. We had a young principal and he was just an exceptional leader. And I remember every school holidays, I would get a card in the mail from the principal and it was handwritten and it was a personalized positive note. It wasn't just, uh, you know, dear Peter, you're doing a great job, but he actually wrote something sort of specific to me and it was quite, quite, impactful so it's something i've tried to do to carry on in my leadership today i now in the days of the internet's but easier sending an email so I, I, I quite often like to send out short emails just encouraging my leadership team because i think those words can really go a long way and just another example in my previous role we actually launched a new campus from scratch on a greenfield site so starting a school on an empty block of land is a, a really big task to fulfill. And one of the first things I needed to do was to appoint a new head of campus for the role. So my role was what we call executive principal. So I was overseeing the mother campus and also this new campus. And we went through this process of um, interviewing prospective applicants to be this new head of campus. And I appointed this uh, young leader who was probably in her mid thirties at the time. Her name was um, Jennifer. And she was you know, considerably younger than me, but we worked so hard together to get this school built from scratch. And we were doing enrollment interviews with families in a, in a small building on, on the ground and trying to sell this vision of this school that didn't exist to get parents to enroll. And But Jen just did this amazing job in pouring her whole heart into the role. She just did an amazing job in building the culture of the school, she was out on the grounds, getting those ready. And we just worked really well together. And even though she was, you know, a, a little bit younger than me, she did have an impact on me, influence on me as a leader as well. That's incredible. I, I've mm. had someone come on the podcast and talk about this idea of reverse mentoring. And I love that idea because it's, um, it, 
sometimes we think really intentionally about learning from older people and we think more informally about, I can, you know, you can learn from anyone story because there are, there are people who are younger than us um, mm. who we can learn lots from, but I think leaders, uh, I think it's a really interesting idea actually for leaders, reverse mentoring, particularly when our, and in education sector is a great example when there's so much, of a push on things like ICT and technology and, and um, it's not your specialty or, or background um, in, in lots of ways. I've uh, learning from younger leaders around those, not just those things. It can be about, um, there's just so much we can learn, not only from people older than us, but, uh, but also younger than us. So yeah, that's, that's that's a how you learn from her and, and working with her so closely. If we go back to the leader who wrote the handwritten note, can you remind me um, what his name was, sorry? His name was Stuart, Stuart Doyley. Stuart, yeah. I, I'd love to ask, yeah. because when I hear about a leader like that who had a great influence on you, I'm putting you on the other stories from Stuart and how he led and um, story, you know, how he dealt with the he was able to work with parents, you know, in education or if, how he was able or any advice he gave you that really stuck with you? Mm. Uh, I think with, um, with Stuart, I just, we knew, all the staff knew that we had his 100% backing, no matter what happened in the school. He was always there to stand with us. And that's, you know, very reassuring as a young leader. Like he, in a moment's notice, if there was some something going on in a classroom, he'd step in and cover the class for you so that you could deal with the situation. And he... He shielded us from, and we had some pretty serious issues with students and he would um, take that on board and take a strong lead in dealing with some of those difficult situations you get with parents and with students. And he, and he just did it with such a, a humble attitude. Um, he worked incredibly hard, like he was there very early and very late, um, which maybe not is not such a great thing with the work-life balance, reflecting back. Um, but just, I think it was his humble ad attitude and his integrity just really shone through because he walked the talk and mm. people observe you and how you act as a leader. You, Australians are very good at spotting a, a hypocrite or someone that's not <laughs> walking the talk. And you can't be a pretender as a leader because your actions really do shine through. And he, he certainly was a great example of um, a servant leader. Yeah. Yeah, he's like a great leader, and and um, I love what you shared there about modeling, modeling the way, and and how yeah, it it is a real Aussie thing, isn't it as well? I think um, people all around the world, and uh, particularly kids as well, you know, kids can pick up when someone's mm. not authentic, or uh, but Aussies don't really stand for someone who says something and does another uh, as no, a culture. It's, it's it's yeah, it's, exactly it's not right. it's not a popular it's not a popular trait. Mm. it's interesting we're about to go to a uh, as as we're recording this we're about to go to a um a federal election tomorrow uh, in australia and mm. i feel like i'm um, just just having this conversation has reminded me of yeah that's so it, it's so um true Poli politicians around the world and politics is always you know a really interesting thing but gee it's always one one thing is when someone in uh, in high levels of uh, of power here in australia in politics says something but then does something else um i've never thought of it that way that it's not just a thing it's not just a character thing generally it's probably an aussie thing where people go actually uh it's it's in our culture a bit to go no nah, if you're not going to do what you say you're going to do then we don't want you to be leading us mm even in politics. I think a real leader actually owns their mistakes as well. And you actually gain respect as a leader if you get up in front of a staff and say, look, I've made a mistake, I've learned from it, and this is what I'm going to do to rectify it moving forward. But unfortunately, we don't really see that from our politicians. So the respect level goes down if they're leaders. So, you know, if they do make a mistake, they're quite good at deflecting or blaming someone else. You know, it's pretty rare for politicians to put their hand up and say, yeah. look, yeah, we have a mistake there like, and, and wear it. It just doesn't happen. So that's why there's, I think there's an undercurrent of 
um, dissatisfaction with our political leaders at the moment. I think you hit the nail on the head. And I'd love to ask your advice as a leader who um, I'm assuming has made a mistake from time to time in 35 years. <laughs> um, what have you learned about, you know, what have you learned for leaders who are listening? When, when you realize, oh, wow, you know, you have one of those moments where it's in a meeting or it's in the quiet of your, your own office where you realize, oh, I've dropped the ball there or, oh, wow, I've just realized I said that and I shouldn't have said that because I wasn't taking that into account and whatever, whatever it is, when you make any kind of mistake, what advice would you give about how to move forward from there and in, in what steps do you take in a way that does not only have integrity but, um, yeah, honours the, the people involved and helps, you know, to, to own it effectively? What does that look like? Yeah, I think just to be conscious that your words wield a lot of power as a leader, and that can be for good or bad, and just to really choose your words wisely. Because I know there's been times when I've said things in the moment or in the emotion of the moment, and it's almost like I've said them and I wanted to take them straight back, but it's too late because it, it's, it's already been said. So just as best as you can, choose your words wisely. But if you do make a mistake, just to own it. And people actually, I find, will respect you and honour you even more as a leader if you own your mistakes, say sorry, and commit to rectifying it and, and moving on. Yeah, it is simple, isn't it? It's not easy, but it is simple. I feel like that's, uh, I love that Patrick Lencioni quote. It's about building teams, but I feel like it goes for all of leadership. Um, you know, that that building a healthy team where you could say leading, leading well is both uh, remarkably simple and possible, but painfully difficult. Mm. And owning your owning your mistakes is, is one of those things. Yeah, it is actually pretty simple. It's definitely possible. Anyone can do it. But mm. when it's your own thing and you've got to then take the hit and actually, yeah, it's hard. It's it's um and it it is painful, but it's it's worth it, particularly because you, you just have to model that. If you want others to lead like that, then it has to start with the 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 leader of the organization. Yeah. But the uh, ironic thing is you'll actually gain a lot more respect as a leader if you own your mistakes and say sorry. But if you choose to blame others or deflect or not own your mistakes, you actually lose respect with your team. Yeah, that's yeah, that is the ironic thing, isn't it? You think mm. you you're gaining respect by not admitting it, but you're actually losing mm. it. Um, so I'm interested to know, Peter, as you think of your career so far, can you think of any aha moments for you as a leader where the penny really dropped because you you maybe you made a mistake and you learned a lesson that you've never forgotten, or you um you were able to to deal with something with the team member or to you learned something from from another leader um or you you were handling a crisis and and things actually went really well with because you managed it in a certain way any aha moments that sure. popped into your mind look there was i did have a significant aha moment it was actually all the way back in 2006 so i was fairly new into my principal tenure and i applied to be a part of this course at Melbourne Uni on Leadership. It was called Leading Australia Schools. It was facilitated by Aitzel and it was quite impacting on me because the, the the premise of the um, the course was, it was about different leadership styles and they were talking about how as a, an effective leader, we need to use a variety of leadership styles when we confront you know, different situations that require leadership. And before I went on the course, they sent out a survey to my leadership team, an anonymous survey about me, questioning them about what their perceptions of me was as a leader. And when I got to this course, I was presented with the findings of this. And I came out very strong in one particular type of leadership style and, and quite low in the other styles. Um, but the, the aha moment of the course was that we, as a leader, an effective leader, we shouldn't just default into one leadership style when we are confronted with the situation. We should, they gave this analogy of like a bag of golf clubs. And like, if you play golf, if you are on the putting green, you don't get out your pitching wedge to try and get the ball in the hole, you, you choose the putter. 
And it can be like that with leadership situations we encounter. We need to use the appropriate leadership style to, to, to match the situation. They, they, their big thing was that there's sort of six main leadership styles, a directive style, a visionary style, an affiliative style, a participative, participative style, a pace setting style, and a coaching style. And the directive style of leadership, it's great in an emergency situation when you've got to be direct and you've got to make decisions quickly, but it's not great in other situations you're dealing with, with staff or maybe there's another style you need to lose, to use. So I learned all about these styles and then we actually regrouped at the end of the year and they, they surveyed my leadership team again. And I consciously tried to improve in these other areas and the results were quite different. And the survey indicated that I had improved in these other styles and my leadership style had developed. So that was, that was quite an aha moment for me. Yeah, that's, uh, that's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I love the, uh, the golf analogy. That's, that's great. And realizing that um, you might be really strong in one, but like you said, you wouldn't necessarily take a, uh, you know, when you're, when you're on the green, if you're a driver, if you, mm. that's your strength and getting the driver out on the green isn't, isn't, um, isn't the best idea. You need to change style. Do you remember, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot a bit here, but do you remember what the styles were or can you explain them a bit in your own words, just for those who might not have heard of that sort of idea before? I think um, as a young leader, it's easy to default to being a, into the sort of the directive style of leading. You know, so this is what's going to happen. This is the decision and not being at all visionary or um, consultative in any way. It's not really an effective way to lead. It's, it's creating crisis situations. Um, like, like, for example, I remember once I had a, a staff member that was turning up late for school in the morning and I asked the staff member to come into my office to have a chat about this. And if I use the directive style, it would be like, you need to be on time for school today. Just, you know, being a bit very direct about it, but that's not a really effective way to approach that situation. I took a different approach. I spoke to this person, got an understanding of what was going on. And there are actually some valid reasons why this staff meeting, uh, staff member was being late in the morning because there was a quite a difficult situation going on in a staff member's home. And because I'd taken the time to listen to that staff member and approach it in a different way from a leadership perspective, we had a, we, we agreed to a better outcome. Whereas if I had been just directive at the start, it you know, would have gone pear shaped for sure. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, and thank you for unpacking that a little bit. Let's jump into Leadership Express. I've got a few questions for you. The first one I have for you, Peter, what is a book that you've gifted to other people or recommended a lot to other people? I tend to recommend podcasts more than books to, to others. I've really, I have about a 45 minute commute to my role at the moment. So I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and a couple of the ones I've been listening to recently are the, the Craig Groeschel Leadership Podcast. They're fantastic. They're about 20 minutes in length and really packed with practical information. And also the, I've appreciated the John Maxwell Leadership Podcast as well, so similar to the Craig Groeschel in format and just really practical advice on how, how to lead. Yeah, they're great recommendations. Uh, thank you for those. One-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. This is something that a lot of, that comes up a lot for leaders is how to run an effective one-on-one -on -one meeting. What, what advice would you give any, any sort of top tips that you've learned over the years for how to structure or run effective one-on-ones? Mm. One of the things I've done, like I've come into a new school this year. We have 140 staff and I'm brand new. I didn't know any of the staff before I came here. And I, what, I wanted to get to know my staff. So I established this uh, process called a listening tour and I made, I've made individual times to meet with every staff member. So I've, I've met with about 40 staff so far. So I do about one meeting a day for about 30 minutes and I email the staff member about 10 questions to, to have a think about before they come in to meet with me. 
And then I sit down with them and I, and I just listen. I just listen to their, to their story, their background, what they like about the school, what they'd like to see improved, how could I assist them. And that's just been wonderful for me in my context of being a new principal in a school. Just first of all, just to get to know the staff member, but also just to hear their stories. I couldn't recommend that strategy highly enough, whether you're new in a leadership role in a school or if you've been there for a while. And the staff feel greatly appreciated that you would take the time to do that as well. So it's you can only win from yeah, making that yeah. small investment, really, of a 50 to 15 to 30 minute um, meeting with an individual staff member. Just the return is is great. Yeah, that's wonderful advice. Um, and I would agree. I can't recommend that enough for anyone, particularly those stepping into any type of new leadership role or with new people on a team. That is, I, I can't think of anything better. Like you said, is what 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 better way is there to build connection than to sit and ask people those sort of questions and truly listen? Um, mm. I don't think there is anything better. So yeah, hundred percent agree with you and love that recommendation. Okay, what about um? Let me put this one this one to you. Uh, leadership. One of the big that comes up is this idea of time management and work life balance. And so I, I love to ask leaders about you know, being an early riser. Uh, so my question is, do you think being an early riser, like getting up at 5 a.m., is that necessary for someone to be a great leader? Not at all or somewhere in between? How, how does that work for you, Peter? I think it really depends on the individual. It's a, it may work for some people and not for others. I know for myself, I like to get up early, about 5.45, and I take my dog for a walk down the beach. And that's just a great way for me to have some time to myself um, and, and set the scene for the day. Um, but, you know, everyone's, everybody's wired differently. Uh, I've seen other people rise a bit later and, you know, work back later at school. But I think above all, it's important to just have balance in your life. I love that quote, you cannot pour from, a, from an empty cup. And I know in my early days, as a principal, I, I just worked ridiculous hours and I was just on the path to burning myself out, which doesn't do anyone any favor, favors. So it's important to have that that balance in your life. Um, like yes, Just yesterday at school, I arrived here early. We had a board meeting after school and I didn't get home until midnight last night after getting to school, you know, before eight in the morning. And I said to my team my, my business manager and PA who are also at the meeting I said look come in a couple of hours later in the morning you know just get it's really important to, to rest and recover because you're not going to do anyone's you're not going to work any smarter I feel hardly coming to work on hardly any sleep and then you know trying to get you get your way through the day but just having that extra couple of hours I think even though the day may be a bit shorter, I think you work more productively during that time. And I think, um, unfortunately, some leaders sort of wear it as a badge of honour, the hours that they work. But I question the, the benefit of that. I think it's more important to work smarter and make the most out of your time. Yes, um, that's great advice. What is, so say you're sitting across from a leader uh, and they said, Peter, what, help them as leader. Sorry. Anything sorry, with... Johnny. Sorry, what, the what's... question. Oh, sorry. What, what leaders could stop doing to be a better stop leader? Doing. Yeah. Ah, stop doing. That's a that's a interesting question. I think um, just putting some, I suppose, some boundaries in their life. So maybe you know not checking emails late into the evening because that has an effect on you and could di disrupt sleep patterns which will ultimately affect your productivity at work so just getting that work life balance making sure that's you know, you know right in your life so i suppose it's just mm. you know working smarter working within having time for work work hard when you're at work but then also having time for your family and leisure time having that balance in your life is really important because otherwise you won't be in for the long haul and 
particularly being a, a leader in a school, it's running a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you really need to pace yourself. Yeah, that's great. Um, great advice. A couple more questions. This one can be something lighthearted or you can pick something serious. Uh, what is a movie or TV show that's really influenced you? A couple of movies, actually in the course I mentioned before, that we actually studied two movies. One was Remember the Titans uh, with, with Denzel Washington. And we, we studied the way that his character went about leading this uh, American football team that was trying to integrate um, the different um, cultures into the team. And just the different leadership styles the coach used was just absolutely fascinating. That was quite impactful. And another one we looked at was a film called We Were Soldiers. It had, I think Mel Gibson was the actor in it. And it was the true story of a, a captain, um, his name was Hel Moore in the, in the Vietnam War. And the way that he led his soldiers into battle and, and the types of leadership styles that he used were really inspiring how he galvanised his troops and got him to follow him. So that, they were quite impactful on me in, in terms of a leadership style and just personally one film that um yeah. nothing to do with leadership but was it was actually hotel rwanda it was a, a film about the genocide in rwanda it was a, a true story but it had, had a bit of a positive spin to the story but it was just a, one of those films that really stayed with me and it quite affected it had a big effect on me yeah that's some wonderful recommendations there that people can watch uh last question if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say to them? I love a quote by um, General Norman Schwarzkopf, Storm and Norman. He led the American army in the Gulf War and he had this quote, leadership is a combination of strategy and character. If you must be without one, be without the strategy. So just demonstrating how important, you know, integrity and character is as a leader, it's just so important. Well, for those who've really enjoyed getting to know you a bit on the podcast, I'm just wondering LinkedIn or Twitter, is there, is there any way that people can connect or follow you on uh, online and also find out about the school? Yeah, LinkedIn would be the best place. Brilliant. Excellent. People can go there to find out more about Peter yeah, and the school. Uh, well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. A really great episode jam packed with wonderful stories and notes and uh and lots of other wonderful advice that i think um any leader who listens to this half an hour is going to be able to take a lot of actionable things uh, to grow as a leader out of today so i've loved it um, um don't forget i also have the john o white leadership podcast and the leadership question of the day podcast you can also go and invest uh, by listening to those two other podcasts that i do I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Peter, for being so generous with your time and uh, for, like I said, for sharing great wisdom with us and for being such a joy to, to hang out with. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure, Jono. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved.
We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.